uh, we are currently uh, running an academy for squash and football and i'm very keen on starting an academy for uh, 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 fencing where we can create a platform all the way from beginners to an advanced level and people who can, and players who can represent our country and for which i am seeking um, a lot of assistance and help from jambal sir and the fencing association of india and i do hope to get a lot of cooperation from all of you all to um, achieve this uh, target of mine for fencing joy you have already you have already three four academies where all they established can you tell me so i have three four academies in mumbai bangalore and hyderabad we have over a dozen centers as of today we have a lot of coaches and trainers under us who uh, we uh, have our role and we can and uh, uh, deploy this curriculum all across uh, all across mumbai bangalore and hyderabad at the moment football also we have our own turfs uh, where we um, uh, have our football academies running that's again in mumbai and we will be starting in bangalore pretty soon once hopefully after this lockdown that's over that's great uh, joy we require lot many people like you and uh, I, the proposal you sent me i have already submitted with president fai he will go through it and later on we can arrange something for you thank you so much for joining us joy we require lot of private people like you who have a love for the sports to come and do something for the fencing thank you very much brother to be a dear friend and a keen uh, participant in our zoom session thank you joy thank you Krishan ji, you could find Dr. Peter. Krishan ji, hello. Sir, I think Krishan. Sir, Do Dr. Peter, no. No. Okay, I'll call him. Uh, Muni Nadan is there? Muni Nadan. Let me check, sir. I'll check him. Okay, please check in. I'll just speak to the Dr. Peter meanwhile. Sir, morning. Great, sir. We uh, we have logged in. You can log in within five minutes. around 200 people who are listening to you i extend you all warm welcome sir and a word about dr peter is that he has got an experience of more than i think 45 years in the sports development i have shared the uh, pitiesment of dr peter he specialized in grassroots development he has been an advisor on scientific development issues to united states olympic committee he has been uh canada uh, canada and many uh, around 35 to 50 countries in the world as a sports advisor and we i just came to know today morning through krishan that sir was in nis patiala also for some time sir and uh, he was my tutor in one of the course i did along with the uh, diana is also online sir from macedonia sir and uh, i requested him sir if you can now set up in the country has changed completely we have got a new setup uh, which is dedicated for the development of sports under the able labor uh, leadership of mr kiran rijiju uh, director general sports authority of india series pradhan ji and uh, our uh, noc president who is also a president uh, general secretary who is also a president of fencing association of india mr rajiv mehta so he was kind enough to take time from his busy schedule and uh, sir uh, you need no introduction i am too small if i to introduce you one of the best mind on the sports development in planet on planet sir i only thank you for acknowledging my request and coming and addressing uh, the coaches which we have in india i hope they learn from it and we go on the right track under your guidance and i look forward uh, to work with you in future also in india sir the people from 
स्पोर्ट्स अथॉरिटी ऑफ इंडिया आर आल्सो ऑब्जर्विंग दिस लेसन सर सर ओवर टू यू सर ओके थैंक यू फर्स्ट थिंग आई नीड टू डू इज शेयर माय स्क्रीन सो लेट मी जस्ट डू दिस सो आई आई क्लिक ऑन द शेयर स्क्रीन बटन इज दैट करेक्ट यस सर एंड and then yes it is coming sir is it sharing yes sir yes sir it's already there yes sir you need okay, to uh, sure. make it a big sir yep there you go has that yes sir yes sir okay so uh, vikram if you um if you need me to stop and explain something uh or if you need me to change something just jump in and let me know so Understood. thanks for, thanks everyone for uh, for being here how many do we have vikram that 200 you think sir it around 170 is there and uh, people are still logging in i think we will have around 215 to 20 people sir okay perfect okay so sure. i'm going to talk about periodization in fencing so a couple of things Uh, a couple of things before we start so i'm not a fencing coach okay so i won't be able i'm not planning to tell you how to coach fencing and what the important parts of fencing are that's for you to know so it's really going to be about periodization in general and then you can apply fencing knowledge to that so i have to leave the fencing part to you okay so let me go through this and i'm going to jump back and forth between this powerpoint and an excel spreadsheet and i think uh, vikram you shared this this spreadsheet already yes sir yes sir okay very good so we'll we'll jump to that in a few minutes and i hope the people uh, that are listening i hope you have a pencil and paper because i have a few questions for you and if you don't it doesn't matter um you can just do it mentally so first of all who am i vikram explained a little bit so i started out as an exercise physiologist with nike and the australian institute of sport a long time ago so um Uh, and periodization so when i was an exercise physiologist a practicing exercise physiologist in the 80s and 90s last century um things have changed a little bit so it, it's moved on a little bit so from a physiologist and this is important because i think it puts the the periodization idea and what you need to know as a coach i think it puts it into some context so i transitioned from a physiologist to the management side of of sport of sport uh, right before the sydney games where i was involved in the olympic the preparation program for the sydney olympics and then i moved to the united states olympic committee and i was director of coaching and sport sciences and technology and then to uh, the canadian olympic committee so when i changed from being a physiologist to being more in the management administration side i came to realize that there's a lot more to to coaching and preparation than just the physiology side and just the sports science side there's a lot of other factors which which I'll talk about in a minute and so for the last 12 years I've been running my own consulting business first it was sport performance management but now it's called Apex Global Sport Group and so I've been doing that for the last 12 years and I do things like a strategic analysis program analysis and analysis of programs what's working and what's not I uh, do a lot of strategic planning a lot of program development uh, which could include periodization or could include uh, preparation for you know major games like olympic and paralympic preparation or asian games preparation so that's what I do now so uh, I put that in the context of going from a very specific thing like periodization and people just seem tend to think that's just physiology and science but it's not it's really about overall planning in preparation and thinking through all the elements that you have to think through as a coach okay so before we start i want you to write down or think about right now two questions how much do you know about periodization today on a scale of 1 to 10 virtually nothing is zero and extensive you're an expert uh, number 10 so just write down right this minute what you think your number is and if you've written down number 10 Uh, you're an extensive extensive knowledge and you're an expert then i want you to take over the rest of this class so because uh, because you probably know more than i do so that's the first question the second question is how much do you use periodization in your coaching practice today 
So zero, not at all, virtually never use periodization, you're not sure what it is, to 10 being you use it all the time, very extensive, and you use it in all your coaching plans for all your athletes and teams. So, so just write that down, zero to 10 for how much you know, and zero to 10 on how much you use it in your practice. And we'll come back to that later on. Okay, so hopefully you've got two numbers there. So the other thing that's important to think about is uh, to, to go through periodization in one hour is a little silly. It's a little crazy. You know, a lot of times if you're in university or coaching school, you would spend a whole term on this or a whole coaching module, and then you do years and years of practice to get it right. So this will only be a brief overview. It's not going to cover everything you need to know but hopefully it'll give you a flavor and a taste. And, and if you do know about periodization now, then hopefully this will confirm some of the things you do and you know, think, yes, you're on the right track. And if you don't know it, I want, you, I want to give you a flavor and a taste so that um, you, you, you start to explore it a little further, okay? So definition, my definition of periodization, which is pretty similar to most you find in most books, is it's a systematic way to arrange and organize different training elements and phases throughout the season or the year. Okay, so it's just a way to organize everything that you need to do as a coach. So the, the, the training, the preparation, the techniques, the tactics, the life of the, of the athletes and players that you have, and, and just a way to organize them in a systematic way. Okay, and some people call it yearly training plans, some people call it quadrennial training plans. Uh, you know, different groups call it different things. So very simply, it's planning and seeing when training elements start and stop or overlap with each other. So just thinking about where, what, it, what, what should happen. And you can't keep track of everything in your mind all at once. You need to have this on some sort of plan or some sort of template. So when do things start and stop? When do they overlap? What should start and stop first? Uh, organizing the priorities for training and competition and recovery. So what are the priorities? So what things are more important than other things? You can do a lot of different things as a coach. You, know, you can do endurance work, strength work, technique work, tactics. You can have altitude camps. You can have um, testing sessions. But what are the priorities? So how do you figure out the priorities and put one before the other? And it just helps to put things on a calendar in a scientifically and strategic sequence. Okay, so you can start to see alignments. What things line up with each other? What things clash with each other? Uh, what things should should go together, what things should go, go apart, okay? And again, um, if we talk about the physiology or the science of sport, you know, in terms of endurance work versus power work versus speed work, um, should you lift, you know, every day? Should you lift upper body, then lower body? All those things, I'm not going to go into all of them. They're all different lessons. They're all different classes. Um, but I'm just going to point out that some things should happen in sequence. Some people, some things can happen at the same time and other things should not be put together, they should be kept apart, okay? Okay, so before we get into the details, I think there are three important points that I want to just go over first. One is the Apex 365 model. This is the model that I use in my consulting to, to help coaches or administrators understand all the elements that need to come together for a successful program. Okay, we'll go, I'll, go, I'll go through that very quickly. Very quickly, we'll go through training theory because that's, that's fundamental to periodization. And then we'll talk about the four corners training model or my version, which is actually five, five corners or five pieces. So, and, and you may have heard of, I doubt you've heard of the Apex 365 model. Uh, you, I'm sure some of you know something about training theory and some of you may have already heard about uh, the four corners model. Okay, so first of all, the Apex 365 model. This is, and this is the way I look at um, all sport programs. When I start working with a program to do an analysis or to do strategic planning, this is the way I approach it. It's a complete way to understand and manage the system, whether we're talking about teams or clubs or national federations or even countries, national sports systems. So if I was looking at the Indian national sports system, I'd look at, I'd look at this the same way I'd look at your fencing club or the same way I'd look at the Indian fencing, the, the uh, Federation uh, Fencing India. Okay, so that this is, this is the model that I use. So the first thing to think about is that within any organization, you have three key functions. 
the sport organization management. So that's how the, how the organization is managed from the business side or from the, from the governance management side. Then there's the high performance management, which obviously is how you manage the high performance side. And then there's the sport development management, how you manage the grassroots and development and the athlete pathways. So any organization or federation or country, all these, these three are the three key elements of any organization. So then we have six critical success factors. So these are the things, and these are more relevant to coaches now, particularly when we start to talk about performance. Everything that you do as a coach, every high performance program, every training program, at some point, these six factors need to be thought through and, they, and they'll have an impact on how you coach and how successful you are. And, and you can see them there, athlete development, uh, governance and management, sports sciences and medicine and technology, training and environment, uh, the um, uh, competition management and the technical staff development. So if we look at this a different way, the, here are the six. So here are some examples. This is not everything you need to think about, but in terms of athlete development, you, start, you think about things like player development pathways, long-term athlete development, talent ID programs, how athletes are selected, what's the process there, their career and education, training loads, all those sorts of things. Similar things for coaching, recruitment, retention, succession planning, professional development, coach education, certification. Uh, for competition, uh, you need to have a strategic calendar that's usually aligned with long-term athlete development. Uh, things like familiarization, simula simulation of competition, international hosting perhaps. Um, for management, uh, oops, for uh, the daily training environment, you have to think about where you're training, what the facilities are like, where they're located, what access do you have to other non-fencing things like dry land training, like strength training or, or, um, or pools or tracks and things like that. Things for cross training uh, in the sports sciences, obviously this is where, my, where I first came from in physiology. So a comprehensive program that's cost effective, that's integrated with each other, easy to do, quick access, not too complicated. Uh, one, one element there, um, the, the pictures of everyone <laughs> goes right across the bottom of my screen. So I keep moving it around so I can see. Um, but uh, the, the one thing I'll, men I'll mention here, I'll come back to it, I hope. If I don't, Vikram, remind me, the integrated support team. So this is the group of the, the support team. Some coaches have access to experts, some don't. And some, some uh, coaches are lucky enough to have a team around them. So hopefully I'll come back to that. And then the other thing, of course, is making science or evidence-based decisions. So, hope, you know, you don't always have the, the, the luxury that, for example, the coaches I worked with in Australia or the U.S. Olympic Committee have to have this high-level team to give you all the information. But as much as possible, coaches should be making evidence-based decisions, not just going with gut feel or, you know, something their coach told them when they were young. So... Uh, try and use evidence and science as much as possible. And then governance and management. So in your coaching uh, practice, when we talk about you know, where governance and management comes in, but obviously you have things like policy and process, the culture of the team, um, the budget, uh, the high performance program per se, whether or not you're continuing to learn. So Vikram's ordering some pizza already. <laughs> Okay, so, so all those things, there's a lot of things there in those six critical success factors. But um, uh, if we just look at the ones right here in, uh, in red, these are the ones that really come into play when you talk about periodization. So training loads, player welfare, um, the sports science, sports medicine testing, recruiting coaches that understand periodization. So you wanna hire the right sort of people, uh, the competition uh, elements in red, um, in governance, the policies and procedures, the culture, all those things that all come together that are all necessary. So, so when I talk about the, the three, six, five, the six critical success factors, these are the six critical success factors and the ones in red are the ones that seem they'll have the, the closest connection with um, periodization. So the last part is, is the, of the three, six, five, of the five pillars of a sports system, all P's. So people, policies, places, planning, and partnerships. 
Now I'll come back to this one at the end, but you can't be successful unless you give pay attention to these five. So, so that's, that's my apex three, six, five model, three key functions of an organization, six critical success factors and five pillars of, of a sports system. So we'll come back to the last one later. So the next thing, before we get into periodization is the training theory. This is a very simplified version. I'm sure if you've done any coaching courses, you've gone through this stress recovery adapt adaptation or the SRA. Basically, uh, you, stress, um, you stress the body, uh, allow it time to recover, and it adap adapts, it gets better. Theoretically, that's the whole basis of exercise and training and what we do. And so there's a lot, there's a lot to that. We could talk about this one for a whole semester if we wanted, but um, you know, in two minutes, that's the, the simple version of training theory. Okay, so a couple of things to think about. So different, different body structures and functions take a different amount of time to develop. Okay, and that's more or less determined by human physiology. When I say more or less, so I have a degree in physiology and I think that I know, I used to know a fair bit about it. I don't know as much as the experts now. But one thing I did learn is that not everybody responds the same way. So don't think that if you read something in a textbook or a physiology textbook, that the body will do this. If you, if you train it this way, if you stress it this way, then this will happen. It doesn't automatically happen exactly the way it says in a textbook. Okay. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Skill acquisition, the same thing. The basis of skill acquisition in fencing or any sport is repetition whether it's single repetition or doing things in sequence one after another. So it's, and it's repetition, repetition, repetition. It's repetition under stress, it's repetition at speed. But in all those things, the adaptation rate varies from person to person. Now that's, that's important later on when we start talking about periodization and how long you spend in a certain area, how long you spend on endurance, how long you spend on learning a new skill how long you spend on putting different skills together, that varies, depends on person to person. And you can't guarantee that everyone will be exactly the same, okay? There are fast and slow adapters and fast and slow responders to pretty much everything we do. So if, you know, if, I, if I'm training a runner and I want them to improve certain enzymes or their muscle fiber structure, I'm pretty sure it's gonna take six weeks or eight weeks but it might take someone 10 weeks and it might take someone four weeks to have the same response. So that's part of, that's the art of being a coach. That's where you start to learn and start to think, okay, this person looks like they're adapting quicker. Let's move to the next step. This one's taking a little longer. Let's slow down a little bit and, and wait before we move to the next step. That's, that's the art of coaching. Okay. So the, the, in terms of the stress recovery adaptation, uh, everyone responds slightly different, differently. So too much stress without too short a recovery period, that equals overtraining and injury. Too little stress and too long recovery, that leads to undertraining or detraining. Okay? And you can't train all the body systems at the same time or at the same intensity. You can, but you won't get successful results. And you'll get people that are injured, people that don't learn properly, you know, that they don't... They don't uh, learn the skills properly because they're tired, they're injured, or they're sick, or and the body doesn't respond the correct way. And that's why you need something like periodization so you can get the right stress recovery adaptation in sequence so that you optimize training. Okay. So, so somebody some body systems such as strength endurance can be built up with intense periods of training. And then they can be maintained at that level with short bouts of intensity. So in periodization, you can front load certain things like endurance or like strength, and then you can back them off a little bit while you work on other things, such as technique and tactics, as long as you keep a high level of intensity. And again, not everyone responds at the same way. Not everyone detrains at the same rate. So people, people take different speeds to get up to a certain level. They take different speeds to come down. Some people can maintain their fitness longer. Some people don't. And that's all based on the fact that when you read a journal or you read a scientific article or you read something in a textbook, all that information, all that sports science is just a guide. It's all based on averages. Okay. So when you get averages, you've got some people in the average, you've got some people that are above the average and some people are below. And so if you're looking at, you know, how, how thousands and thousands of people react, the average will be pretty close. If, 
but when you're coaching four or five athletes, it might be that you have one or two of those athletes that are above the average or one or two that are below the average. That's why people don't respond at exactly the same rate. So as much as I'm a science guy and as much as I believe in evidence-based decisions, you have to observe athletes and make your own decision based on the science and based on what you're seeing firsthand. Okay. A couple of other things to mention. Um, my, I'll talk about microcycles, mesocycles, and macrocycles. So a microcycle is usually a period of about a week. So usually a period of about one week. And these are the definitions that are in the periodization book by Tudor, the books by Tudor Bumper. And I think you know, most coaches will have seen this book or had this book. If you don't have one of these books by Tudor Bumper, you should go and get one because that's, that's truly the Bible of periodization. Everything you need to know is in the, in the books that he puts out. And then a macro cycle is a longer period, maybe up to six weeks. Excuse me, maybe up to six weeks, but they could be longer. They're not necessarily just one week or just six weeks. It could be longer. And then a mesocycle is the periods in between that. And that just allows you to, to look at large train blocks, what, you know, what you want to do in this six or seven or eight week block, and then what you want to do in a week by week basis in a, in a micro cycle. Okay. So the other thing, the last thing was the four corners. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the four corners principle. So that means that every athlete in every sport, whether it's fencing or weightlifting or swimming, there are four things to, that you really have to consider when you're putting together the training program. The physical elements, the mental elements, the technical elements, and the tactical elements. And then the fifth one is their life management. So everything that you do as a coach in fencing, fits into one of these five areas. Their physical issues, their mental issues, technical fencing, tactical fencing, and then their life management, management their, their career, their education, their family, their relationships, everything. Okay, so now I want you to get back, go back to your paper and I want you to make a little list. Write down what you think, and this is not a test because I can't come and test you all, but just write down what you think are the top three things necessary to make a good fencer in each of those five areas what are the top three physical things the top three mental things the top three technical things tactical and life just write them down you're not going to be tested but then you can start to think about them in your periodized plan i'll give you two minutes to do that i'm just going to go outside and get a glass of water and uh so when i come back uh, we'll see if you've if you've written some of them down Okay, how are people going with that? Okay, so three physical things that are necessary. So I would say obviously endurance or stamina, um, speed and power, the other thing, perhaps, um, perhaps flexibility. So probably endurance, speed, power, flexibility would come into there at some point. Total strength, I don't, I don't know if you would consider that a a necessary you know, high priority for fencing. So mental issues, we had things like um, uh, arousal control, things like um, resilience, control of adversity, um, uh, self positive self-talk, uh, concentration, focus concentration, goal setting, time management, things like that. Technical, tactical, they're up to you. You're a fencing coach. Um, I'm not a fencing coach. I have done a fair bit of work with uh, Fencing Canada. I did strategic planning with them and the US fencing, but I'm not a fencing expert. So I'll leave that part to you. And then life management. Some of the things I mentioned before is they're obviously their education, their school, university, their family management, um, their relationships, their career management, if they need to work or not work and so forth. So, so hopefully you have a little list of things that might come into your periodization plan uh, soon in the future as we build this, okay? So when we start to build the periodization plan, I'm gonna switch over to a different template soon, the one that I sent you. So first of all, the way I like to do it, and, and actually here's another point. 
if you read the book by Tudor Bumper, it has a lot of good information in there and different people approach periodization in a different way. This is the way I like to approach it. And I've mainly coached um, uh, track and field athletes, mainly distance runners, um, some swimmers, uh, basketball players. So, so everyone approaches it slightly different. So I'd like to start, first of all, with the key or peak competition. That's your main focus. So whatever your key competition is, um, you know, whether it's national championships, whether it's Olympic Games, whether it's the state championships, whatever it is you're focusing on, you usually start with that key targeted or peak competition. That's your, that's, that's your key focus. So then thinking about when that is, I like to allow for two or three weeks before the competition for physical tapering and mental sharpening. So a period right before for two or three, sometimes maybe uh, I wouldn't go probably much longer than three, but you know, two or three weeks where the load is reduced, the physical load is reduced, the mental load is reduced, and there's a focus just on the competition so people can, can peak and taper in that period. And then I, I like to allow for one or two weeks after the peak competition for recovery, for mental and physical recovery. So set your key competition and then go two or three weeks before for physical tapering and then two, one or two weeks afterwards for, for recovery. Okay, and then from that point, then you start to work backwards, back to where you are now. And so then you start to enter all the other things for other competitions or camps and all the physical, mental, technical, tactical elements. Okay, so we're going to, and so it's building a complex puzzle. So you always start with the end point and then work backwards. Okay, so I think I'm going to jump over now. So we're going to go to that Excel spreadsheet that I send people. So whether or not you have that printed or whether it's on your, um, uh, computer. Vikram, are you going to say something? You look like you're about to say something. Uh, sir, nothing like that. Uh, now, uh, in the first phase, Dr. Peters has told you how the, he's doing it and what all things is covered. Now, you have an Excel sheet on your computer. Pe hai, if you have taken a printout of that, now he will tell you how to go about that Excel sheet vis-a-vis uh, -vis period, periodization. Sir, please go ahead. I just conveyed them in my mother language also. Okay, good. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do here is just work through a simple, build a simple spreadsheet that, that will hopefully just give you the idea, give you the rough, the rough concept of what we're trying to do. So first of all, let me, let, let's look up the top, that, the, the black bar up the top. I want you to read that and I want you to remember that this is not your real program. Okay. This is just a, a sample. It's just putting together a, a, a periodized program that really, Technically, when you look at it, it might not make a lot of sense because it won't be exact. So if anyone thinks this is their real program, and if anyone starts to use this as their real program, uh, if I find out about it, um, I'll probably come and find you in India and, uh, and take it away from you and tear it up in front of your athletes. So, so don't, don't try and actually use this in a real setting. This is just an example, okay? So hopefully we'll go with that. So if you look at this, what I've created here, just on a simple Excel spreadsheet, um, across the top, I've got months. Uh, and Vikram, can you see the cursor when I move it around the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'll try and do it slowly. If I'm going too fast, just jump in and say so. Okay. So I looked and I think, I think, what's what's uh, typical in india right you usually have your national championships in february sometime uh sir we our calendar starts uh, from uh, uh, you can say august but the main championship that is our senior senior category it is in the month of december or january sir oh okay so i looked online and the last couple were in february but so let's assume that your your championships are in february so when obviously okay. when you build your own your own periodization plan then your national championships or the or whatever the key competition is that would be you put that at the correct date so let's just say it's in february so i've mapped out here a 12 month calendar from one february up until the next february so i said okay here's um here's the key competition and then we'll build everything we'll start everything from that everything from that point so if you look at this i'll make this a little bigger for you so if you look at this, what I've done was key competition, uh, two weeks afterwards for recovery and two weeks before, three weeks before for a taper period, a period of, 
of, of redu re reduction in training load where people can start to physically taper and, and feel a bit better for, and get ready for the key competition. So that, that length of time will vary from athlete to athlete. So some athletes uh, will need longer to taper and some athletes might taper quickly. It also depends on what sort of workload you're doing in this period right before. If it's a super heavy workload, they might need, they might need a little bit longer to recover. And if it's a very light workload coming in for some reason, um, then that might, um, that might vary a little bit. You might need a little less period. And the same with sir, the just a minute. Sir, 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 just a minute. Sir, taper is the uh, lowering of the volume and the load. Unloading. Yes. Okay. Thank it's, you. It's volume reduced. and load. Ko karna, reduce volume and the load is called taper. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay. And the same with recovery. Depending on the athlete, some athletes might recover in one week and be ready to go. Again, others might need a couple of weeks. Okay. So then from this point, once I know what the peak competition is, then I backtrack through the 12 months and add in where all the other competitions are. You might have to do a qualification tournament, say around here some point. You might have other championships that you might either have to go to or you want to go to and the regional championships. And you might have a club competition where you might have competitions every, every second week. And so the, you, you, you have to map out your competition according to what the things you have to do, the things you would like to do, the things in your club, the things in your state, the region and so forth. And so it, everyone will have a slightly different competition schedule. Okay. But so this is the starting point. So in this case, I've, I thought, well, the national championships are in February. I have to do a qualification in December. And then I've had these other competitions that I have to do for the regional championships that, that for some reason might be compulsory or they might not. And so I'd mapped out the competition calendar for 12 months along that row there in row seven. Okay. And you might notice here that another thing I put in was right before the competition, right, right before the competition, uh, the taper period, I added another competition. So I thought, you know, if I'm, if I'm coaching this athlete, I want to make sure they're close to being ready and everything's going okay. So I put in a competition here, or it could be, I could put it, um, could put it here, it doesn't matter, just to see how they feel, to see if they're ready, to test a couple of things, to make sure that, that they feel good about you know, where, they, where they stand and so forth. So, so the first thing to do is map out your competition schedule. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Some things you have to do, some things you'd like to do, some things you, you, you won't have a chance to do. And so then now you look at this level here, um, I, down the, so along the top on row seven here, I put all the competitions. And then down the side of the page on the different rows, I put all the different things uh, that, are, that are necessary to happen. The physical elements, the mental elements, technical, tactical, and some testing elements, and then some life elements. So now I'm gonna go across and I'm gonna to start to fill them in one by one, okay? In, in rows nine, 10, 11, this is where I put the macro cycle, the meso cycle, and the micro cycle. So in this particular case, the micro cycle is one week. So every week of the month, there's a new micro cycle. Okay, now and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go down to the micro cycle level now, but that's how you'd map out what you would do every day for the week. What, what uh, fencing training, what non-fencing training you would do, any uh, conditioning work in the gym and so forth. So, so if I, uh, I'll try and come back to that. So anyway, so here's one, the first macro cycle. And this one is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This one's eight weeks long this first macro cycle. And I just, I just put in eight weeks because from the start of the season until the first one or two competitions, that's roughly eight, that's eight weeks. And so I figured this is time to work on basic fitness, not so much fencing, but just to get the season started and get, get the athletes going, okay? So once I've done the competition, I can start to think about the different macro cycles. And so if you look at this one, oops. I've got, um, I'm trying to increase the, the size of this uh, screen, people, but the, the zoom. The zoom top 50%, no, you can 50%. Yeah, I'll make it bigger. Now, the, the zoom um, instructions dropped down over the top of my thing and I couldn't get to it. Okay, so in this period, so, and I've, I'm doing this one now for one year, for 
12, 12 months, 52 weeks. So I've gone through and I thought, thinking about my athletes, and I, actually, let me, let me pause for a second and have you think of another thing. When you make a periodized program, you're not doing it for a textbook, you're doing it for the group of athletes that you're working with. So you need to think about who am I working with? What are they like? Um, you know, what sort of athletes are they? And what are the things that we need to work on? So you might have a group of athletes that are, maybe you have a group of older athletes that are really good at technical and tactical work. They've been around for a while. Um, their fitness is not as good as it was, but their strength is pretty good. So then you can decide, maybe we need to do a bit more work on fitness and a little less work on technical, tactical stuff. Or maybe you've got a very young group, and they, but they're not very fit. So you need to spend a lot of time on fitness development and strength and speed, and also a lot of time on technical. So that will help guide you to figure out how much time do you need to spend on each of those four corners, on each of the technical, tactical, physical, and mental. And so once you have a rough idea, then you can start to build these macro cycles here on row nine to say, you know, we want to just do some work on fitness development for about, for about eight weeks. Then we want to do work on strength and power, speed and power, but not very much on technical, tactical. And then we'll start moving into the technical, tactical area again for about 16 weeks maybe some more really get into more technical tactical and then we'll sharpen up for the main competitions okay so this these lines here on line nine row nine they will vary from team to team and from coach to coach depending on what you need to do and where you think you should spend most of your time so, so not everyone will be the same in fact they, they probably would never be the same and your periodized plan from year to year would probably never be the same so this row nine here, in terms of figuring out your macro cycles, that just gives you, helps you plan the key elements that you need to focus on. And then you can start to fill in everything else underneath. I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, the other thing is what you start off with here in this row, that could change. Okay. Because once you get everything together, you might think, oh man, you know, we want to do a bit, you know, halfway through here, you might think they're not really, they don't have the endurance. So let's, let's back off the street, the strength and speed and keep doing a bit more endurance for a little while. Well, maybe they're not getting their technical work done and you say, we need to do a bit more technical work. So let's bring that in earlier. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. It's, it's quite hard doing a, a presentation and not being able to see everybody you know, to see whether or not they're <laughs> understanding. Okay, so let's jump now to the next one. And again, this is really jumping through this very quickly. So now we want to start thinking about the endurance or the, you know, the basic uh, stamina and endurance that you need for fencing. And I know for fencing, you need, you need endurance, you need strength and speed and agility. All right. Um, and again, you're the fencing coaches, you can decide how important each one, each one of those is and um, to, to the players that you have and react accordingly. So let me jump down I move down on the screen here. And I've got some, uh, some boxes here. So for endurance, you might have three different levels. So level one might be easy session, level two might be medium sessions, and level three might be high intensity endurance work. And then R would be recovery. Same with the strength work. Level one could be easy, easy strength work. Level two, easy, uh, relatively, easy you now maybe one high intensity a week and then level three could be a couple of sessions a week with two high intensities and then r would be recovery so this is just a one way that you can do this and uh, and easily put in the level of training that you want for every week in your in each of the boxes above based on level one two or three now if you look online or if you look in um any a textbook like the two to bond different ways that people rank this some people rank at high medium low some like rank at level one two and three some just call it a b and c it doesn't matter as long as you've got a way to describe different training levels for different things for endurance or strength or power or speed well then you can easily fill in the boxes above and while i'm down here it's the same for the technical and tactical work for fencing, for technical work, 
it might be light technical work, maybe just two or three sessions a week in fencing, just simple, you know, fencing instruction, not, not highly technical. Level two could be four or five sessions a week at a very, at a medium level, a bit more time in each, in each training session on technical work. And then level three could be high level technical work every day. And it's the main focus of the training session versus another issue where tactics could be the main focus or endurance or some other, other thing. Okay. So, and then same with tactical level one, two or three. The important point to remember here is you need to have some way to measure the level of technical, tactical uh, and, and physical and mental endurance and strength so that you can put them up in the boxes up here above but that and you can come up with your own way to measure that you can measure it by heart rate you can measure it by um, uh, just having your own measuring system you can some people do it by perceived exertion where they just ask the athletes they have a rough idea how hard they think they're working but you as long as you have a way to uh, to track the level of intensity and the amount of time you spend on each each factor is the important thing. So let's go back to this one. I'm looking just the endurance phase right now. So through this period here, so starting in the first macro cycle, this, which is focusing on fitness development on cell nine. If you look at this, the first week, I'm saying the endurance level, beginning of the season should be pretty low, pretty easy, basic endurance, not a lot of fencing work at all. Basically, in, you know, low level endurance, low level endurance, jump it up a little bit for two weeks, jump it up to high intensity for the fifth week, and then give a week of recovery. So it's, so in this point here, working across from the beginning of the season, level one, level one, level two, level two, level three, then recovery. And then for the next training, then we can jump up into more intensity. So level three, and then another level three. And then now we're moving into a bit more strength and speed work with a little bit of tactical but you want to maintain your endurance. So I've, I've just kept them at two, a level three, a two, a three, a two, a three, just vary it up a little bit. So they're getting their endurance work, but they're also getting a bit of recovery. So see what I've done here, starting at the beginning of the season, I've got easy, easy, bit harder, bit harder, very hard recovery, very hard, bit easy, hard, easy. So I've gone all the way across and I haven't done it for the whole year. I've just stopped here to see, to get a feel for where, where are they? You know, that'll be decided when they get to that point. Now, by the time they get to this point, you might look at them after these competitions up here and say, wow, their endurance is really great. We can probably back off endurance a little bit. So just throw in a few high intensity sessions and they'll maintain their endurance or they might be terrible. They might be running out of gas in the first, you know, the, the first few minutes of the competition. And so you might say they need to work more on endurance. So, so I don't like to map everything out for the whole year and be locked in. I want to get things started, but then wait until we get to somewhere you know, a few months into the season before I start to you know, continue on. So I want to get a feel here for how they, how they look. I hope that makes sense. Now, the same thing for strength. So if we look at the strength, oh, look at that. Sir, sir, wait, wait, wait. Somebody has unmuted. Wait, 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 sir, wait. Sir, you have. Okay, I think I'm not. That... Yes, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Sir. Yeah. So it, it muted, and it, it said that you muted me, but I didn't think you did. No, that. no. Somebody else did it. Sir. Somebody else did it. Sir. Somebody doesn't like what I'm saying, I guess. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I understand. 
No, no, sir. Actually, there must have been there two, three co-hosts. Somebody has errorlessly put the button, sir. Please go ahead. It is very informative. I'm getting a lot of feedback, sir. Thank you. Okay, I have some some people. My wife tries to mute me a lot, so she says it's enough. Just mute. Um, that is universal, sir. <laughs> so Bouyan is thinking it's the other way around. You should just okay. So um, I was talking about endurance. Now we're talking about strength. So it's the same concept for strength. So in, you'll notice here um, uh, strength. I, I haven't done any strength work in the first six, first five weeks. So empty, 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 empty. And then I start to introduce some strength work, very light strength work after about six weeks. And then we start to increase the intensity as we go through. Okay. And then I get, get to this point here, same point. I think now it's time to take a look. You know, do they need more strength work? Do we need to keep working on it? Or do we back off a little bit? Okay, so that's for strength, speed, same way. Uh, every time I go to a new screen, it, it jumps down to 50% and I can't see it. Um, and so, so here we have the speed work, same way. I've started that a little bit later. You might decide to start it earlier. You might say, listen, we've got one of the slowest teams in history, so we're gonna work more on speed than we will on endurance. So you might switch them around. You say, let's start speed work early. We'll start the, the strength work later, perhaps. So that, that's up to you as a coach and with your support team to figure out. Okay, so again, it's the same concept. I have a, a rating scale for what level one, two or three is and I'd plug them into the different, uh, different areas. Same with agility. I've got agility. Now agility, it's a bit harder to, um, it's a bit harder to, uh, to measure agility work and flexibility work. So what I've done here, I've said we do agility one time a week, once a week, once a week, we'll work specifically on agility. And then later on, I wanna jump it up to twice a week and then we'll leave it at twice a week, but then we'll decide, do we need to keep going with this at this level? Do we need to increase it or do we need to back off? Okay, so I've only gone up to week 25, 26 with agility. Same with flexibility. Flexibility is pretty important with um, in fencing, as far as I remember. So with flexibility, uh, Again, once a week, moving up to twice a week, and then up to three times a week, once we get around here to week 22, 23, 24. So we've gone um, everything uh, in sequence. So starting off easy, getting a bit more intense, and then, then adding more. So with this particular example, oh, and then let's do nutrition before I, uh, before I jump to the next thing. So with nutrition, Again, this depends on how important you think nutrition is. You could do, if you have someone who can come in and do a lesson once a week or do some education once a week, or might be just once a month, it's up to you. I, the way I built this one today, I have someone, some nutrition lesson or some nutrition idea once a week. And it might be just to have a meal with the team, uh, have a meal once a week with the team together. Um, so I've got them doing one nutrition, something nutrition once a week all the way through as we get closer to the main competition, um, which is up here, you know, the key competition, I've gone to twice a week. But again, that's up to you. If you've got a group that has really good nutrition practices and habits, you might only do it once a month. Okay. So now I've got, now I move down to mental preparation. So with mental preparation, that's all the things I said before, um, focus control, resilience, adverse, dealing with adversity, team dynamics um, uh, and there might be things that you do yourself or they might be things that you have an expert come in that you might have a sports psychologist or mental trainer come in and work on things so whatever the things are then you need to plug them in to say so this is what i want for the mental the mental preparation the psychological side so the way i've built this i've got nothing in the first eight weeks and then I want one session every other week. I I've, I've, have someone coming in and then twice a week to work on specific things that you think they need. And then after that, then you say, well, we'll decide then if we want to do more of this or less of this. Now, the way I've built this now is it not working on anything in the mental on the mental development side for eight weeks. 
but then you notice this lines up with the competitions. If I have these competitions here every other week, there might be something that I want to work on in the, in, in the week here in this competition. So let's work on that. And then the following week we'll work on a new thing or then maybe twice a week. So you could do something on mental preparation every week if you wanted. You could do it every other week. Um, you could do two or three times a week. It just depends uh, how important you think it is. And it's very important. Uh, it, it depends on whether or not you have some expert help with you or whether or not you feel comfortable covering certain topics yourself. Okay, so what we've done there, we've gone through the physical and the mental side of the four corners. Now we talk about technical, the technical side and the tactical side. And again, I'm going to have to leave this up to you in terms of how much, where you put this in and how much intensity you would put in. Because that's going to vary, for, again, from, uh, from coach to coach and, and from uh, athletes to athletes, depending on how good they are and what the level of competition is. But in this example here, I've got, you know, in terms of very low level techni uh, technical work to start the season. And then as these competitions start to happen, then we start to do more and more advanced technical work and more often. And so you start to build this up. So it becomes the main focus of the training sessions. So if you do this, if you start to make the general fencing skills and the competition fencing skills, the main focus of all the training sessions of each week, well then some other things like endurance or like um, strength and speed will have to drop off a little bit. Okay, so that's the balance you'll have to figure out. Okay. So this is, this is where you come in. This is where your skills take over as a coach in terms of understanding um, what, how, how much to add of each section. So remember at the beginning, I said I'm not a fencing coach, so I can't tell you how much fencing skill and tactical and technical development you need to do. But um, the point is you need to just build the sequence in, from lowest to highest as you go through the season according to what you need according to when the competitions are and according to how your athletes are responding. So just as now, if you move further down now to the testing and planning, here is an example. At the beginning of, a, of the season, a lot of coaches like to get basic medical testing done. So at the very beginning of the season, actually, let me go up to here. Uh, yeah, at the very beginning, oops. Sorry, I'm not driving this very well. At the very beginning of the season, you might say, let's get some testing done here, this purple box. And then we know what sort of work they need to do for injury management and health management and so forth. The same with some sports science testing. You might want to do tests here and then oh, there should be an X on that one. Um, so you might want to do some testing at the beginning of the season and then that will help you decide whether or not you need more endurance work or more speed or more strength based on their fitness tests. So if you do something at the beginning of the season and then testing throughout the season, it's at very specific times. Now what I've done here, I put in a test at this, at this point right here. And then I've done another test about eight weeks later. This is to see how, how's that endurance and, um, and how's the endurance program going? How's their basic level of fitness? So I know their starting point. I give them about eight weeks and I can see if that's working or not. And then they've got the competition period up here and I, I wouldn't do another test until after, after the competition period's finished to see how they're, how they're tracking on their, on their speed and strength and power, okay? Now, just while I'm thinking of it, while I'm in this fitness strength uh, speed testing area, if I go back across the page here, all the way out to the most important competition, if this is their most important competition in February, I want to do another set of tests, either medical tests or fitness, strength, power, speed test. I want to do that far enough away from the national championships, far enough away that if there's anything wrong, I've got time to fix it. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't do a test right before the national championships. You wouldn't do it two or three weeks before because then you might get bad results, but then you've got no time to change it. If you do a test you know, six or eight weeks out away from, the, from your major competition, You've got enough time to make a change if you need to make a change. Okay, so you need to plug in your fitness test wherever you think they would go. Okay, and just for the sake of argument, I put them at those periods. At the beginning, after eight weeks, could be 10, could be 12, doesn't matter. And then middle of the season, 
and then right soon before the major competition that I can do something. Okay. Now, if you remember the beginning of the, of the session, I talked about your, your uh, expert team, your integrated support team. Some of you, I'd love to see a show of hands, but some of you will have some experts that help you. You'll have a sport, a, a physiologist or a um, physiotherapist or a doctor or a strength coach, someone like that. Some of you have to do everything yourself. So you don't have a team. Some of you will have a team. Okay. Now, if you had this group of people that, that I talk about here in, in this cell here, if you have this group of people that's helping advise you building to build the plan, I call them the integrated support team. So they're the support team that integrates all their knowledge together as a group and they support what you want to do. They give you advice to say, we should do testing here and then, the, and then we should do more, more endurance, less strength, more strength, less whatever, more mental work, whatever it is. And so this team should be advising you on how to build this periodized program. So you might want to have special meetings with this team throughout the season just to have them check on results, check on uh, how, how the team's progressing, to get feedback for you, to see if you're still on track for this major event. I hope that makes sense. So basically, if you do have a team, you need to plug in when they meet and, uh, and how often they meet. So actually, here's one here. If you did fitness testing on this week and this cell here that I just highlighted, I'd probably also put in a, a a fitness uh, the support team meeting there so they could talk about the results and tell you what the results were so that's something that i would i would change okay so that's the testing and planning side the last piece is your life side the school exams the university exams any public holidays any times when the gyms might be closed um, uh, when we did this for um, the canadian olympic speed skating team we had a periodized plan for the last year leading into the games, but we had to account for the fact that the gym, or the, sorry, the, um, the, the skating rink would be closed for the last three months of the season while they built it up for the Olympic games. So we had to go in and we had to add something down here to say, um, you know, gym closed. And then we had to go across and say, well, the gym's gonna be closed you know, in this period, so we can't train the way we wanted to train. School, school exams, university exams, public holidays. Um, uh, and then also the coach's holidays. When is the coach gonna take a holiday? So all of you now, I can't see you now, but I'm gonna turn the cameras back on. All of you are probably thinking, what coach holidays? Coaches don't get holidays. But um, I'm gonna suggest that you do take a holiday, that you do take a break from the team. And that's as much as for your benefit it is for theirs, just to get away from you. Uh, and for you to get away from them. So I think you need to plug in your vacation, a little break from the team at some point during the season. So let's say maybe you take two weeks here and say, I'm gonna be gone uh, away from the team in, in this period that I just made black. So right here, yeah, I'm gonna go. And that's locked in. So you can't get out of it and say, no, I changed my mind. And so this is good for you to get away from the team. It's good for the team to get away from you. And it's also good for the assistant coach to have a chance to do something um, and, and, and try some things. It's a good way for you to delegate. And here's the other thing. It's a good way for you to know that someone else can take over if, if, you, if you get sick. So what happens if you get out here to the national championships and then you um, have a car accident or you get sick and you can't go to the national championships? Okay. If you have never given your assistant coaches the opportunity to coach here, and if you've never given your athletes the experience of being with someone else, if you're not there at the national championships, that's a major shock and that can upset everything. So I think you need to build in periods away from the team. Okay, so, and when I say that, you need to build it in right up here at the beginning when you make the periodized plan. So you think, okay, here's the time when I'm gone. Not, not when you feel like it later on, say, oh, I think I'll go now. So you need to plan it and map it out. Okay, so if, we, if we've done this now, here we have a periodized plan. Um, I'm just gonna make this a little smaller now so you'll just get the, the, the general overview. You won't be able to read it so well. But we've got a calendar up here of competitions. 
lead, all leading up to the national championships. You've got a major qualification competition that you have to go to perhaps. Then you've got other competitions that are nice to go to and, but not necessary to be all the time. And then you've mapped out the different physical, physical, mental, technical, tactical, the testing and the life situation that you've mapped out for the whole year. So now when you look at this, you can look at it and say, you know, I know where we're going. I know what we need to work on. The athletes know what they need to work on and where they're going. So everyone's happy now that you've got a good plan. So that's, that stops you from jumping around and say, oh, let's do this this week. No, let's do this next week. You've got a plan. You tend to stick to a plan better than if you don't have anything written down. So, so that's how I would build a plan. Uh, I believe I have... Um, Let's go back to this one now, back to the spreadsheet, back to the um, PowerPoint. So once you've built that, then you're going to need to go back and cross checks for clashes in intensity. And by that, uh, you need to cross check for clashes in intensity, cross check for any um, clashes in key training areas, or if the macro cycles are too small. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by that. Let me jump back to the, to the um, Excel. So when I did this, we did this for the Australian water polo team in leading up to the Sydney games. And uh, this is a great example of, of the coach working with the support team really well. So the coach said, this is what I want to do. I want to go to these competitions and I want to, uh, and one thing I haven't put in here is training camps, but I want to have these camps and these training competitions. And then the, the, the each person, the physiologist and the physical, the um, sports psychologists, uh, and the doctors, they all looked at it and said, okay, I think we need to do um, a little different. I think we need to spend a bit more time, for example, on, on fitness development. So let's, let's make this one a little bit longer. Okay. And the coach said, okay, yeah, we can do that. And then they said, um, and these competitions, there's too many here together. So let's not do this competition as an example. And the coach said, uh, no. Uh, I want to go to that competition and I want to go to this one. So we're going to do it no matter what. So then they went back and said, okay, if we're going to do that, they're going to need more recovery. So they went down here and instead of doing a level three, they did recovery. So instead of doing a level three here, they did more recovery. So then the coach said, good, good. You know, I want them, I want these important competitions. So they adjusted their endurance work and they might've adjusted their strength work as well. So they might've made this a number three recovery as well. So you see what I'm doing there? I'm going back and I'm looking at each, how each thing aligns with everything else and say, well, this, is, uh, this one's gonna be an easy competition. So we can do a lot of fitness work here, but these two are important competitions. So we're gonna back off the fitness work and do more work on technical tactical. Does that make sense? Somebody nod, Biljana. <laughs> I can see your picture. Yes, sir. So, so I just learning. want to make sure Very that's learning. making sense. Yeah. So once you get through, once you build the plan to start with, that's just the starting point. Then you can go back and start to look for clashes, uh, alignments with certain things, um, talk to some experts and say, okay, you know, this is what I want to do. Does this still make sense? Okay. So we're nearly finished. So then you, you look for alignments and, um, and things like that. So you start to shift things around. So once you put it on paper, it doesn't mean you can't shift things around. You can start to move sequences. You can start to move macro cycles. You can eliminate some things to say, listen, we're not gonna do that competition now, or we're not gonna do that testing. We're gonna shift it around, okay? So don't be afraid to do that. And now I, I mentioned the five pillars earlier. So you need, you can't do this on your own. You need some other people, whoops. You need some other people to help you build this plan. You need some other people to do testing perhaps. You need to have the right places to do the training, the, you know, the, dry, the, the gym training, the strength training, the fencing training. You need to have the right policies in place to say this is mandatory. If you're running a club, you should be saying to all your coaches, you all need to have, the, our policy is a periodized plan. And our policy is to have nutrition in all the plans or mental training or injury management. So um, you need to have policies to make this work and you need to have partnerships with, you know, testing partners, with other coaches, with gym owners and so forth. So the five pillars 
that people, policies, places, partnerships, and planning are very critical to building a periodized plan. It's not just an exercise in science, an exercise in, in, in physiology. It's everything, all the pieces together. Okay. And, and I mentioned these books earlier, the periodization books. Tudor Bumper has a, a several periodization books, sometimes for strength, sometimes for training. Um, and, and you'll also find some, some things in the literature about fencing specific periodization. So look for them. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't have these books, I would encourage you to get them somehow as soon as possible. So let me finish up on this. So periodization, it's as much as an art as it is a science. You don't have to be a high level physiologist or scientist to figure this out. That helps. But as much as an art on you reading your athletes and you thinking about the important elements of you know, what you should do or shouldn't do and trying to line them up in a logical, sensible way. Okay, the sciences are involved, but it's a lot more than just physiology and medicine and psychology. It's, it's, it's that art of putting things together. You have to, first of all, you have to know your plan and your athlete and your philosophy and style of coaching. You have to start with that always. You always start out with your philosophy and say, what sort of coach do I want to be? What sort of team do I want to have? You know, do I want to have a team that, that dominates on fitness or dominates on technique or a mixture of both? Do I want to have a team that's aggressive and, and attacks first? Or do I want to have a team that, that's very strategic and, and thoughtful or all? And so you need to think about that before you start building your plan. Okay. It's the same as when you build a house, you know, no one starts building a house without giving a thought to how many bedrooms they want and, and whether or not it's the summer house or their everyday living house or whether it's for a big family or a small family. So you have to get your philosophy and your basic plan figured out before you start building, you know, actually building it and don't be afraid to experiment. You know, try different things at different times. Try, try doing a bit more endurance or a bit less speed work or sometimes a bit more technique than tactics. But don't experiment right before your biggest competition. I have lots and lots of stories of coaches who change things in the week or the month before the championships, national championships or the Olympics, and it always ends in failure. So don't be afraid to experiment early in the season. Don't be afraid to experiment with a junior team and, and then and see, see what happens. But don't experiment with your, your main team and your main athletes right before the biggest um, competitions. And then and obviously get help from experts and read and learn more. The more you can read, the more you can find out. There's a ton of information out there on the internet about periodization and about periodization for fencing. Uh, and you need to, uh, to read and learn. Okay. And uh, that might be... Okay, now let's go back to your first question. You wrote down in the beginning what you thought you knew about periodization um, and write down what you think you know now. And hopefully it's a bigger number. So um, hopefully you've known a little bit more now than you did before. And then also write down how you think you'll use it in the future now and whether you use it more or less or, you know, in every all your practice plans and all your, all your coaching sessions or or just a little bit from time to time. So, so hopefully those numbers have both gone up. Um, I'll be successful if that's happened, but of course I won't know. Uh, and now that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you have any, uh, Vikram, I don't know if you want to have questions or comments. Um, sir, 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 uh, sir, first of all, uh, it, is, it is one of the best learnings I have in my life. And, oh, uh, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm very, very thankful to you again uh, that you could time out, take out some time for, from your busy schedule. And it is a great learning. And when uh, I circulated your, uh, uh, this Excel sheet to the people, I asked them to uh, send me questions if they have. I have got only four questions with me, sir. Yeah. Three related to periodization and one is related to grassroots level. So, uh, because most of the people say that this is something new for them, let them go through it, let them sink in, and then first they need to understand rather than asking question for the heck of it, sir. So, sir, mm -hmm. first I will uh, take you to the person who wants to start fencing. He's already holding three or four uh, uh, games in four or five metros of country. He's into football, rugby, and other sports. He wanted mm -hmm. to start fencing, sir. Uh, he has got a very specific question, sir. Uh, Jay, I am unmuting you. After that, I am coming to Rashid, Deepak and Krishan. These three questions I have got. Thank you. Jay, please ask your question. I, 
Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for this. I think it was amazing how you've gone through this entire periodization explanation. Um, so I, uh, you had, you had, you've thrown a lot of light on how the periodization for coaching and for coaches should be there. Uh, is it possible for you to uh, share some, uh, some of your inputs on um, period, periodization and development of a fencing academy uh, from ground to, um, to an advanced level as well? I'm not sure what what you mean, Jay. You mean uh, no? I you I, I didn't I didn't further. Okay, no, uh, 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 sir. He wants to. Uh, he said that uh, you have got a some com com complex model where uh, fencing can be started from a grassroot level mm -hmm. uh, uh, academy. It's not as a club. You can say, sir, from okay. grassroot level, and uh, you can further extend it. It is basically he wants to spend and he wants to invest in fencing academies all over India, sir. So he just okay. want to discuss how we can he can go about it. Especially comment from this side. Okay, not not so much periodization, but how you can build um, grassroots, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, because I probably wouldn't do periodization for for young kids, like for grassroots. Although you know the way I like to coach is it's from an education perspective. I was a, a primary school teacher uh, to start with, and so coaching is education. So even though you're not periodize, periodize, periodizing with the young kids, you're still educating them as to why you're doing stretching, why are you doing this before you do this? You know, why, why aren't we doing, you know, a whole lot of training right now? Why are we just working on this part? So that's always an education. But for the young kids, um, you know, if you follow the, the best practice in athlete development, you know, a long-term athlete development from Canada, or the Australian model, which is called the FTEM model, or the New Zealand model, or other models, until they get to about 14 years old, they need to try different sports, sample multiple sports. So if you want to set up a fencing academy, the focus can be on fencing, but I'd still involve other sports. Let them do some athletics and some gymnastics and, you know, and games, lots of games, lots of fun. So, and with fencing, you can, you can do fencing and have lots of fun games, you know, even though it's a, obviously a serious sport, but, but with the junior academies, I would have um, uh, lots of fun games, lots of trying different sports, lots of um, uh, freedom of movement and lots of, you know, um, things that aren't necessarily just, excuse me, aren't necessarily just fencing, but, okay. but always, and, and, but then if you have the, the senior level there at the same time, they should see what the seniors do, but but do it at a different fun level for themselves. And okay. I think the mistake is we try to make the younger kids do it too hard, too seriously, too soon. Sir, 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 I just explained in my mother language yes. what Dr. Peter is saying ki that till 14 years of age, you have to adopt a sports sampling ka concept. Adopt karna chahiye. Yahan pe aap sirf fencing specific academy na ho. You have an academy of gymnastic athletics so people should play all kind of sports uh, up to 14 years then the specialization one should get into after 14 years only thank you sir no another question thank is from you, rashid please go ahead i'm unmuting you ask your question i'll modify the question for understanding please uh, thank you thank you so much uh, dr peter it's a wonderful session uh, my question is uh, based on physiology uh, uh, very few athletes in a um, cycle of, uh, I mean, month of uh, training in a one cycle, they act very well. They act very great during training. But for a few days, they are very down. They are not perform up to the, uh, you know, level. Why so? What are the reasons behind? Dr. Peter, I will further modify the question. He, he discussed this question with me yesterday. He wanted to say that uh, in a cycle of one month, particular days, the energy level of the athletes is so good. On particular days, they are very low. What is the scientific reason of that? Okay, could be it could be multiple things. Um, let me let me go back to this. Um, one one thing here is if you look down the very bottom of that sheet that I sent. Okay. Hang on. There it is. This point yeah. right here, let me raise this up to 125. Yeah. If you look, uh, where'd it go? Yeah, look at this down here. The higher the, the higher the intensity, the more recovery they need. So when you yeah. work, if, you, if you're working athletes hard, if you've got two or three 
hard sessions in a week or in a month, you need to do two or three more for recovery. So maybe they're not recovering enough. That strength recovery adaptation, if they're training too hard with too little recovery, then they can handle it, they can handle it, they feel good, and all of a sudden they crash. So for, for two or three weeks, they might handle that, or for two or three or four sessions in a row, they might handle it, but then all of a sudden, it catches up. It could be that. It could be nutrition. It could be just, you know, they're, they're getting dehydrated. They're not matching their training workload with their food or, or hydration. It could be sleep. They might not be getting enough sleep to match with their training loads. And sleep is the best form of recovery you can get. Okay, so it could be a whole bunch of different things. So, so if they're continually, if they're getting tired towards the end of the month over and over again, then I would start to look at how much recovery time you have in your, in your mesocycle, the short block, how much, you know, I'd start to question them about what they're eating or drinking before they come to practice and after practice. And I'd ask them what sort of sleep they're getting before and after practice. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Krishan, Krishan, over to you. Uh, uh, Dr. Peter, this is a coach called Krishan. Uh, he's from NIS Patiala. He met you also. He yes, wants to convey you know. gratitude yep. and he wants to ask you a question also. After that, okay. Deepak, only I have two more questions. Deepak, uh, Krishan ji, please go ahead. Thank you, Peter, for wonderful lecture. I have two questions. First one is regarding the uh, tapering. What you have shown in this uh, Excel sheet, uh, tapering is just before the main competition. I want to know whether this tapering should be before each competition and what should be the load ratio of at that phase. That means tapering phase. It should be what is the ratio between technical and tactical training and the physical development. Ooh, the ratio, I, I don't know. I mean, that's that's very hard to um, uh, to tell you exactly how much you should do. That varies from from group to group. You might have a group that's very good technically, you know, with their weapon and they, they know exactly their footwork might be great, their attacks might be great, but, but tech, tactically they might attack at the wrong time. They might, they might not be able to counterattack or whatever. So you, you have to know your athletes to say, you know, technically very good, tactically very bad. So we need to have a higher ratio of technical to tactical. Or you might have a group that's very good technically but their fitness is terrible and they run out of gas halfway through the bout. So you might say the, the ratio between endurance and technical might be different. So you have to figure that out as a coach. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's nothing I can tell you to say, you now this is the ratio and, and you tell everyone the same because everyone's not the same. Okay. I think that, that helps. The other, but the other, and the other that, one is uh, regarding the, uh, but I noticed this is a, like a block periodization. Yes. And I want to know for each block periodization, like can we can get one or two main development qualities, like maybe strength or speed. What should yep. be the uh, like work ratio, load ratio for the maintenance of the other motor uh, qualities which you have developed in previous uh, uh, macro cycle? Okay, let me, let me just go back. I'll answer one of the, the, your other questions first. You asked me whether or not you should taper for every competition. Yeah. Okay. So it just depends on how important you think some of these competitions are. So you know, early in the season, you probably wouldn't taper for all these competitions through here. Is that showing up on the screen when I highlight each of them? Yes. Yes. Is yes, that showing yes. up? Yeah. Yes. So yes. in some, some competitions, you might just train through them. I don't know if you use the same terminology. You, you train through you yes. know, you're not speaking for them, so they're not important. But you might say, just as an example, based on your calendar, perhaps this one here in, um, you, know, whatever, um, you know, whatever week that is, perhaps this one that I just made green, that might be a very important competition. So you might say, listen, I want to I peak for this one, like a mini peak. So you might say, for these two weeks, we're going to do a mini taper. So you, then you might go back and you might say, listen, um, uh, for these two weeks before, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to make sure the endurance is light. Now, so we're going to do one for endurance and one for there. We're going to do one for strength and one for, you know, for the two weeks before. So you might just, you might decide this is an important competition. So let's do a mini peak and a mini taper. And you might do the same here, but I probably wouldn't. Early in the season, probably not. But for a 12-month block, 
you could probably get in for some athletes two, two full cycles or three. You might say you want to peak, then come back down, recover, then come back and peak again. Yeah, it just depends Thanks. on your season. Okay. okay. Now, what was the other question about? Um, it was regarding the this uh, block periodization. What I have noticed, this is like a kind of a block periodization. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. each macro cycle, we are developing one or two motor qualities or technical or technical qualities. My each macro cycle. Or each macro cycle, because we are emphasizing only on one or two uh, parameters. But yeah. we can maintain the other one. But how we can maintain, what should be the load ratio for the maintenance of the previously um, uh, developed uh, motor qualities and how many sessions we should follow for maintenance? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to answer that one very well because, uh, like I said, it's been a, while, a fair while since I've done good physiology. But when you, you get to endurance or strength, I know these two, you can back off the endurance and strength work and do perhaps... 50% of the duration and 50% of the volume, but keep the intensity high and you'll, you'll maintain your levels. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, it, Dr. It, it, please. Hmm? Sir, okay. sir, please, sir. Please, sir. Yeah, now uh, you can keep, as long as you keep the intensity high, the intensity high, you can back off the duration and the, and the frequency and still maintain your levels. But the exact well. numbers, I, I, I'm not sure I'm in a good position to tell you right now. Thank you, sir. That will be that, that that will suffice the answer, sir. Only two two more questions, and then we will uh, will 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 bid, bid you farewell, sir. First question is, sir, can you explain how we should go for it in go in a transition period? It should be complete rest or active recovery, sir. In the recovery, uh, yeah. In transition period, sir. In transit period, you should yeah. uh, be concentrating on comp complete rest or active recovery, sir depends how, what the intensity was beforehand. I mean, if you, if it's been a very hard long, you're talking about this period here at the end after the main yes. competition. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it depends. No, no, if this, was, if no, this no. was a very, a very high intensive training session to lead up and a very hard, very hard championships or competition, I would perhaps say one week of nothing. And then the second week active recovery, cycling, no. walking, uh, swimming, things like that. So it just depends on how, how hard it is. You know, if it wasn't a very hard championships, you know, it, maybe they got knocked out in the, you know, the first two rounds and then, yeah. then, they, then they went home. I would say um, perhaps, uh, you know, you, you could just go straight to active recovery. The, the, the message I'm trying to get across Vikram is that I think you have guidelines but you have to know your athletes. You have to be able to look at them and say, listen, I think, and talk to them. I, th I think they're totally wiped out. And so I'm gonna say, take the week off, don't do anything, and then do some active recovery. Or they might say, hey, we ready to go, we ready to go, I wanna go now. Let's get back to training. And I'd say, okay, let's just do active recovery and then we'll go back. You know, I, I coached one athlete who was very intense, very mentally, very physically, very mentally intense, trained very hard, was a very, very intense athlete. Now, when she, we, when she finished the national championships, all she wanted to do was start training the next day. She, I want to get better for the next time. You know, she, you know, even if she won, which she did, you know, the national championships. And I would say, no, you've worked so hard. I want you to take a, a week off. Any longer than a week, and she would have been attacking me. You know, okay. and so I had to just say, listen, and I think maybe even five days is all she can tolerate. Someone else needs oh. 10 days. So, 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 individual specific. Now, sir, last question. Uh, Deepak, Deepak, please go ahead. Deepak, Deepak, I'm unmuting you. Deepak, Deepak is Deepak. Are you listening to me? Hello, Deepak. Wait, Deepak. If you are, I think he not. No, sir. Uh, I think he is not muting. I will ask the last question before uh, we uh, bid farewell to you. Sir, like uh, you said about the periodization, uh, I have got a very basic uh, clarification to be seek from you. Like most of the Premier Leagues which we watch, Football Premier League, like English Premier League, uh, French Premier League. So these people have uh, matches on all weekends. In fact, sometimes twice a week, sir. Yep. So how they plan their periodization, uh, if you can give, tell me briefly, uh, keeping in mind active recovery and everything, because a lot of uh, chaos is there, sir. 
how yeah. they do that there is some advanced periodization or uh, some active recovery can you throw light on that sir just give me one second to answer that i've got to run and get i'm going, i've got i'm down to 1 sec 1% power i don't want to run out sir, in the middle of the, of the answer one second sir sir please 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 sir. Guys, there are a number of questions, but we are not taking all those questions. Have we requested you? You should, you should have sent those questions yesterday because Dr. Peter wanted to see those questions. So we cannot put him on you in an awkward position now. Hence, we are just taking okay. the last question. So please. Okay, good. Sorry, I was nearly out. I forgot to put, plug in. Um, well, first of all, a lot of the professional teams don't manage their science well. They don't manage their teams well. They do have, some of them do have good recovery, so they make up for it with that. Um, some of them do rotate players. So if you look at the English Premier League, and they, they're playing Premier League, Euro, you know, European Cup, whatever, you know, Europa, whatever it is. Um, they do rotate the players in and out. And I think, or they, or they give them less time on the field. But um, there was one very good football team here, Australian football team here in uh, Australia a few years ago that periodized their season and basically decided to give up a few games early in the season and work on their fitness. So they went into the season, instead of training in their preseason and then going into the league, the league routine, they kept training well into the season, training really hard, but understood that they could sacrifice a few games they wouldn't necessarily win everything but they then but they decided then they would start to back off so when they got to the finals they would be peaking instead of being injured and, and, and out of gas and so they did that and they won the premiership twice and so that was one example some of them do periodize but not like not like i just showed you there because they can't afford to peak you know have recovery focus on certain things but that they will they will build up for certain games of the season. They'll say, listen, this game against, you know, Manchester City is our most important game. So we're going to, we're going to focus on that. We might back off the first two games before that, and then we'll build up, but it's not typically what, what we would look at. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, sir, you have been specialized in so many things. You've been a physiologist, grassroots developer, advisor, scientific advisor on sport. Most of the coaches want to know, do you run some courses or you have some small seminars uh, where, for a certification where they can go and attend and earn these degrees and certifications and qualification on that, sir? Is you can something if you can suggest, sir, so that people can go and apply there, sir? Something that I do. Yeah, something you do for, uh, to which increase their qualification and uh, like a course no. they attend or seminars or upgradation places. No, I don't. I don't do any courses or seminars any anymore at all, um, except this one. Um, so, but uh, no, I, I don't anymore. I just I, I mainly do strategic planning and building programs for for Olympic committees or federations. But um, you know, I don't do any physiology or any uh, any courses anymore. I do I do lecture at universities sometimes in the US, um, but not not very not very much anymore. Too busy. I know that, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you introduce us to one of the most scientific concepts which is required for the development of sport. Uh, there are people from Sports Authority of India is watching, and hopefully uh, we'll start from there and try and get you in India for some time for the most advanced uh, lessons on that, sir. Uh, sir, again. Uh, you adhere to my request. I thank you very much. It was a wonderful thing. I think it will uh, take us ahead. Uh, it's created a platform. Around 210 people who are watching you today. It is a treat to learn from you, sir. And I would request everybody, please give a round of applause to Dr. Peter for sparing her precious time, sir. Thank you very much. You have been such a wonderful teacher. And personally, I will get in touch with you, sir, whenever I am in doubt, sir. I have got that right, sir, being a student of yours, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much, sir. It was such a wonderful day. Please stay safe, sir. Thank, Thank you very much.